So unless you learn how to invest and build equity, build passive income, then you basically just had a job. You don't have any retirement. All right, guys, so today we have Chris Bounds, and he's going to talk to us about his journey, how he got started investing, and a little bit on how to get started investing. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Brian? Awesome. I'm doing great. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful week. And um, yeah, things are good. Life's good. Better than I deserve. But <laughs> tell me, how did you get started in investing? Yeah, my grandfather invested in real estate, so I, I don't know if that specifically set the bug. I do remember my parents having a rental property and as a kid going to help clean it up as tenants. I didn't know, but I'm assuming as tenants, like in between tenants. And then I read in college a, a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. That's the journey for a lot of investors. And it, it really, I read this book and I'm really like, holy cow, I'm going to be rich. And um, now, look, from, from a high level, to the, like philosophical level, it's great. It, it, it puts together pieces that they already knew and thought about money, but it puts it together in such a well-organized manner that I was like, holy cow. Now, there's a whole other side to it. There's actually the nuts and bolts side to actually getting out and building a, uh, a business or a real estate investing uh, company or strategy and all that. So it, the book doesn't go into that, but yeah, after reading that book, I'm like, holy cow. And then I started thinking back of what my uh, grandpa did and my parents' rental property and get the little spinning. Ended up doing four deals my first year in college. Oh, wow. <laughs> or no, okay, no, sorry. My four, four deals in college, not my first year. I was a, a junior, I think when I read the book or um, going into senior year or something, something like that. It was what 2005. Did you, what did you study in college? technology management. I'm a professional PowerPoint presentation giver. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, I, mean, I guess that actually that is valuable these days, but uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's so cool. So how did the deals go when you first, like those first deals that you did in college? Yeah. Like, like I said, the, the book, it got, it got me motivated, but it didn't tell me, teach me the nuts and bolts. So I'm out there like, making offers, going on MLS. I had no idea what I was doing. And it, it's funny now, but man, I feel sorry for, for some of the, the realtors. We <laughs> basically wasted their time. Like I didn't have a job. I had a credit card. Otherwise I was a broke college student. But then I saw this, this sign. It was a bandit sign. And it said something like millionaire seeks mentee. Mill, mill, millionaire real estate investor seeks mentee. Now, probably sounds a little shady, but hey, I gave it a call. I trusted the guy. It was like 1500 bucks for a weekend boot camp. And I say this with a humility and, and, and with a sense of humor too. Like I was dumb enough and uh, naive enough to believe everything he said. So I just did it. Hmm. Every weekend I went dropping, knocking on doors to pre-foreclosures. So I, I went to Texas A&M University. That's in College Station, Texas. But San Antonio at the time was the one of the only counties on the, in the nation online, completely online. So I could research pre-foreclosures. This is 2005, pre-foreclosures is that engine's kind of warming up. And I could research those in my dorm room and then go knock on doors on the weekend. It was about a two and a half hour drive each way. I didn't have enough money to stay for a hotel, pay for a hotel. So I usually would drive back and then drive back the next day. So it would make it a Saturday, Sunday thing. While my college buddies were sleeping over hangovers, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, hustling out there, yeah. but it took, it took three months. Yeah. Three months for someone to actually answer the door to a college kid wearing like Amber Kami shirt and cargo shorts and flip flops or whatever. I have a picture of it too. And sell me their house. And I want to say it was, not, this is fuzzy memory. We bought it for 15, 17,000, something like that. 2005 prices, it needed some work. We ended up closing on it, sold it to another investor. I don't remember exactly what it was, 50,000 or so. And it made a good deal. I, I yeah. did it with the guy that taught me how to do it and we split the proceeds. That's awesome. Yeah, That's awesome. That's that was such... the first one. How did that feel? Like the first, actually the first deal, what, did, what was? Yeah, what was it like? I had a credit card now with it. With, I had debt now. That felt really good. But here's the other thing. I'm a college kid. I just created 20 grand. I, I want to say our take home was after we split it, did the JV with our mentor. It was about maybe 17 grand, maybe 20,000. So 
I'm rich. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't have any bills because college itself is paid for. So uh, like beer money, fun money, and then of course paying off that credit card. I, I'm rich. That felt amazing. <laughs> I just bought a house at 20 years old, 21, when, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I felt amazing. <laughs> That's so cool. And then we did it again. So yeah. the, the next house, we did in Waco, Texas. That's my hometown. It was a uh, accidental deal. I say accidental. It was on the county records as violating the code compliance or code enforcement. Well, what it was, the garage, detached garage or a shed was supposed to have been demolished. It actually already had been demolished, but they didn't take it off the rolls. So lucky me, I got in contact with the owner who's actually the He's the executor of the state, living in Dallas, a friend of his, his friend's estate. He's in charge of getting rid of this house. It's a pain in the butt for him. <laughs> and he needed a lot of work. We did it. I actually signed that contract. And then I ended up finding a buyer before I ever bought, or I closed on the original purchase. <laughs> and then we did a double close. Now, again, this is me looking back. There, there's probably a lot of stuff that I, I wouldn't do today, knowing what I know. But I was out there hustling and um, just taking action, and yeah. uh, it worked out. That's so cool. So that one came through your, like your network. So. No, that, that came from just the code compliance list, looking up uh, code enforcement. So j just like agents may go out and look for properties that they've owned, they've lived there for five, seven years. Maybe they're thinking about upgrading to their second home. All these other little niche lists you can look at, like probates, code enforcement, pre-foreclosures, stuff like that. So a lot of code enforcement, it's like you didn't mow your lawn, so the city is now you know, sending you a notice. But some of them are maybe dangerous buildings or something like that. So that's what this was, a dangerous building. Structural, got yeah. it, awesome. That's so cool. So that was your second deal in college. Second one, college. Third one was a the first lease option we did, which I really wanted to get into owning rental properties. So that's what this one was. We bought it, pre foreclosure, cleaned it all out, did some remodeling, got a tenant in there as a lease option. This is before Texas changed the rules, making that that's a little tricky now. But uh, so that basically was the first rental property we did. So here I am, 21 years old. I've got a rental property in there. Third one, same thing, it was a rental property that had a Section 8 tenant already in there. So we just basically bought it at a discount and um, let that tenant stay there until a until the city went to go inspect it and realized, hey, look, you don't actually, the, the home doesn't pass inspection for Section 8, so the, the tenant's going to leave. So I ended up selling it to another investor and made some profit there. In my first four, four deals, I did the first deal, first pre-foreclosure deal, which actually ended up being a whole tail, meaning I didn't rehab it. First double close, first lease option, and then first section eight. There's a lot of firsts in those few first four deals. And I learned more in that than I ever did in four years of college. Yes, yeah. Like actually going out and doing, like getting deals done. Yeah, this is in the trenches stuff. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, it's not theoretical, it's, it's real life. That's so cool. What's, I guess, like some takeaways after those deals, like what, what's something you could, I guess, like pass on to somebody else who's looking maybe to start? So back then, the, the Google, I don't know if Google existed. Well, I guess 2005. So yeah, the Google existed, but it's like a baby. Just I think they, yeah, yeah they, they just did an IPO. There's no iPhone. There's no, or, or Facebook just came out. So that there, there was no ecosystem for education at scale. Hmm. So all I knew and all I had was this one guy who taught me pre foreclosures and code compliance. That's all I knew. If I can go back, I would actually realize there's a whole, I'm looking at the world through uh, a little pin over say a sheet. And I've got this little glimpse of what I think real estate investing is. But I didn't realize like it's huge. And there's so many more niches that you can get in from actually going after probate or absentee owners or subject to, or like doing marketing campaigns and direct mailers and doing, so pay-per-click was new back then, but I didn't know any of this stuff. Fresh out of college, I, I know how to do PowerPoints. <laughs> so if I can go back, I one realize that if, if you have something that works, yes, stick with that, but continue on the education. Because if I, I think if I, would, I would have done that, we would have been able to buy so many more properties. And then two, here's the next thing. This one's actually probably the bigger lesson. 
the, the number one or one of the biggest things that gets in the way of a great life is a good life. And when I graduated, I had no debt. I owned two rental properties and I moved to Houston and got a sales job that was paying me like $80,000, I think the first year. That's good. Yeah, that, you're, you're and doing, I got a roommate. Yeah, you're doing great. And it's taxes where like cost of living is like really, I moved to Houston, so it's like pretty low. I'm rich from, from my own standards. I, I feel rich. That burning desire, I'm actually subsided a little bit and I'm like doing my thing and I'm reading the news and the news is saying, hey, the world's gonna blow up. And so I just didn't invest until 2011. I didn't do any more deals until 2011 when I got married. I, I think can, tuning out some of the, the noise and then also not letting a good life get in the way of a great life. Okay. I love that. Yeah, it's, sometimes we can become complacent in, in certain regards of maybe not pushing forward where like you were hungry in the very beginning because like for that first deal, it sounds like you were like door knocking for three months. Yeah, well, why is it that like it's always kids that come up with these billion dollar ideas? Like it, it's not that you can't do it when you're 60, but there is a certain level of motivation that you have when you're younger and you're hunger, hungry and you're wanting to make your impact on the world. Yeah. So That's keep so that, stay uncomfortable. Actually, and this is something that other folks have said, like always be working to put yourself out of a job because if you don't, someone else will do it for you. Mm -hmm. So just maintain that mindset that no matter what happens, like you need to be figuring out what the next guy's thinking about because if you don't and they do it for you, like boom, market shifts. Things are moving too fast to stay complacent. Like you've got, and, and real, I, I think realtors are, are very vulnerable here. I've said this for years before I ever knew about some of these big tech companies. Zillow has been around for a while, but there's a lot of other disruptors out there. And I, I've told friends of mine, they're like, look, the brokerage industry, and this is a few years ago. I'm like, hey, the brokerage industry is actually very, it's been resilient to tech and the cloud and, and disruption. And I was like, that's not gonna last forever. Like hmm. it will get disrupted. And when it does, it's gonna catch a lot of people off guard. And it's gonna be really fast. It's gonna put some people out of business. Yeah. And you gotta figure that out because the 22 year old agent is going to be a little bit more hungrier and ready to go after things and after the world than the agent that's done it for 30 years and they're running their brokers and they just have their blinders on and they're just doing the same old. Hmm. So you've always got to be hungry. Yeah, no, absolutely. So shifting gears a little, like if someone wants to get started in investing, like what do you recommend? How do you start? What's the deal? <laughs> so I get that question a lot and I've asked it a few times just to clarify what I thought the, the answers were. And the my hypothesis was correct on answer number one. And then answer number two is, a, is an easy one. Do you own any investment properties now? No, I do not. Okay, okay. Yeah. So why, what would stop you this week from finding an investment property? Or, or if, say you had an investment property that was a good deal, mm. what this week? What would stop you from buying that deal? Probably coming up with the cash. To okay, purchase. there you go, financing. Uh, yeah. That's the number yeah. one reason. Everyone gives it the number one reason. It's actually the easiest thing to solve. You just need to know what to look for. And then two, where you are at right now, say you had the money, what would stop you from doing a deal this week? Oof, if I have the money, uh, I think finding, find, probably finding the right place, especially with inventory low or just, or just in general, not really sure what to look for in investment property. Yeah. So understanding how to analyze what a deal looks like, exit strategies and all the little micro things that go into whether you're going to flip it, wholesale, Airbnb, long-term rental, all that kind of stuff. Because yeah, so. there's so many things you can do. Like, with, like you just mentioned Airbnb, a lot of people are doing that. They're like buying it and making them Airbnbs. Yeah. yeah. Like there's this weird property right before this call, uh, I was talking with my wife and we're, it's a weird property. And it's, it's actually, a, it used to be a daycare. And I'm like, hey, this is right by the coast. This is, the, the property itself is weird, but cause it's like, it's, it's almost like a big cafeteria-ish. Oh, okay, so daycare, it's got a large open area and it's got these beams. So it's almost like a, a triangle type shape. And then it goes deep. And then you've got two bathrooms, one on each side. And then you've got a, a single kitchen and you got this back room. Weird. Like you're, it would take a lot of money to turn that into a house, not worth the area. But I'm like, this is right by the coast. You've got 
the, there's a yacht club nearby. There's docks nearby. I was like, we just deck this thing out, make it look like a boat or some, some type of fisherman theme. And it's an Airbnb that you can charge and like, maybe it's people who are in the dockyards coming in or, or international employees that are coming in that are gonna sleep five, six here. And they'll do that for 140 a night. Maybe it's a family reunion and they just want a nice place to stay where you can all stay in one location, also still have bathrooms in the kitchen. Or maybe it's uh, six guys who are, you just travel the country and you're going to a fishing tournament that weekend and you need an easy place to stay. So yeah, that, that's something we're looking into that would make no sense for your traditional re rental right. or flip without a lot of upgrades, but what can we do with it as is and just make it look pretty as is and make it work as an investment. So yeah, yeah that's something we're exploring. That's so cool. No, that's great, that's great. So after, yeah, like purchasing or deciding what to do with it, I guess like renovations, is that the next step or what's typically the next step? Yeah, but once you know how you can finance the deal, which is easy. So there's investment companies out there, hard money companies, they'll loan on pretty much anything. All they care about is equity. And then depending on where you are, your market and your personal situation, they may want you to have some money down. The next step is private lenders. There's a lot of rich guys that just, they want alternative investments and in real estate, the good one. So as you get a track record, I mean, we've used $18 million from private lenders over the years to fund our deals. And these are just regular Joe and Sally that they've saved in their 50, 60, and they don't like the stock market and they want something to do with their Roth, like they can invest in real estate. Once you know how to do that and you can analyze the deal, then it's just working with contractors. That part, yes, if you don't know how to manage contractors and stuff, like you, you can get burned. <laughs> There's a lot of bad folks out there that, that you know, just bad contractors, but Referrals, your hard money company probably has some referrals. Your insurance company probably has some referrals. You go to networking events and Facebook groups and all that, they'll have referrals. It's just like anything else. If you don't know the right companies or, or contractors you use, you get referrals. It's like anything else. And if you get enough referral, referrals for the same person, then you probably a good bet, but maybe still get a folks from a few different ones, see who you like. And then once you hire them, you gotta watch them. You gotta know what, um, like I, I can barely hang a picture on the wall. I can't tell you how to lay tile or how to do sheetrock. I can look at it and let you know whether it looks good. Mm -hmm. So I can at least do that. And then as you get experience, you'll, you, depending on your technical expertise and, and uh, desire, you, you'll get a little bit greater appreciation of what actually <laughs> these contractors should be doing. Yes, like the level of work and excellence that you should expect. Awesome. For you, like as being in, because you're also an agent, like what's, mm -hmm. how did that journey look like in terms of becoming an agent? Yeah, 2011, that's when I got married. Now priorities change, thinking of the future. That's like weeks after getting married. My wife tells this story much better than I do. Drop this bomb in her lap and I hey, hey babe, I, I want to go flip houses again. And she comes from a traditional background, so she really nervous about it at first, but she went along with it. And after we got that first deal, she was like, oh, wow, this, this actually works. And, but what we didn't do, we, we were gonna flip. We didn't, we actually ended up, cause we both had jobs. We didn't need the extra money. We ended up pulling rentals. Very smart in 2011, cause where were prices? Yeah, they're low. Way low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, th this was no strategy, it's just, we, that's just what we did. But it was smart because the first three deals, cumulatively, when we sold them later on, it was like $260,000 of net profit, yeah. uh, or not net, a gross profit. But 20, it was 2014, got my license. Decided that, hey, look, I'm gonna be in real estate long-term. A friend of mine, he's like a mentor, unofficial mentor, cause he's, he's flipped 1,700 houses. Yeah, he's like a local legend, Eddie Gant. He's got a hard money company in Houston, and he, they actually funded my first few deals. So he at a network meeting, I, I asked him, I was like, hey, do you think I should get my license? He's like, absolutely. He goes, it, it can't hurt you, it can never hurt you. And if you're gonna be a professional, make it official. Hmm. So got licensed, which I did it sooner, 2015, went full time. And then we started scaling a flipping business. We're, we're doing significantly less flips these days, partially because 
it, it, it's you got to pay pay more for them. We ultimately want to build wealth and passive income. That's why we get involved in real estate. I'm doing a bit more of the retail side and holding rentals, holding rentals. So that, that's our main focus right now. And as we explore other options like multifamily storage units or mobile home parks. So yeah, when I got licensed, it was really mainly to support the investing business. Hmm. And then of course it adds an extra, it adds options. I can list someone's home. Maybe I'm talking to them and hmm. they want to sell, but they're not going to sell what I need as an investor would have to pay. It's an extra tool. Like instead of the hammer, maybe I use the mallet or the screwdriver or whatever. It's an extra tool. So I can actually go in and approach it in the situation of how can I help you? Yeah. And then maybe that's me buy it mm -hmm. because you're like, you need this thing closed tomorrow or in three days because you're about to get foreclosed on. Maybe it's you want to get every dollar you can out of it because this is your retirement savings. And then we list it on MLS and it's more of a traditional realm. Or maybe it's something in between. Hmm. I don't know. We can just have that open conversation and see how I, how can I add value? How can I solve your problem? Yes. Yeah. I and mean, I think that's key. Like 100%. Like when you're approaching like people and, and trying to help them like genuinely. That's so cool. Yeah. So this is where agents mess up. So agents before Zillow, before Open Door, OfferPad, Redfin, all, all those folks that like, it's like a dead horse. They just like to beat them up. And I get it. Zillow does not, they're not looking out for real estate agents and realtors' interests. They're not. No, no. But you know who they are looking out for? They're looking out for the, 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 con the, the consumer. consumer. Yes. Whether it's really in the consumer's best interest or not, <laughs> it's the consumer that decides so I get these, I see these comments and it's funny because we're like, oh, the, these investors, they're just ripping people off and they get so much more li listing on MLS. Here's a case study. A friend of mine, actual friend from church says, hey, I'm moving. Cool. Go do a CMA, go out to the house. Like, all right, hey, look, this is what's going on. You can sell your house for this much and you really don't need to do anything. Just clean it up. They're like, yeah, but we can't risk having another mortgage. Like we're buying another house, mm -hmm. uh, we're moving. I'm like, I know it's like, trust me, it's, it will sell quickly. Yeah. You don't need to worry about it. Even if you want to discount a little bit, you can. I was like, but if you want, I can get you a quote from an eye buyer, like an open door. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did, we got those quotes. Big gap in her net. She went with open door. But they went with open door, why? Because it was guaranteed. Oh. Even though I told them and showed them, hey, look, these are the days in the market in your area. These are what they look like. Your house looks like them. It's not like they've got these extravagant remodels. It's not something that's that different about them. It's like they could, you could actually sell and it would close relatively really? quickly within your time frame, and you'll come out of pocket net. I don't, yeah. I don't remember exactly what the numbers were, but maybe twenty grand. Yeah. More. Still went with open door. Interesting. Guaranteed. Some consumers don't care about the net. Yeah. They do care about solving their problem. That's and super interesting. Now, this is what I'm able to do. Open door yeah. pays a referral fee. Hmm. Okay, sure. I'll help you through the whole process. And yeah. the great thing is it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. So that's what I did. I helped her. It was her it was her choice. Yes. I was more than willing to go with either option she wanted to go to. So I can have that conversation with any seller whatsoever, but the, the traditional realtor doesn't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you need to sell your house, like open doors, they'll have sophisticated language, but in essence, they'll probably say open door sucks, it all yeah, sucks, sure. like you're, they're gonna take advantage of you, this, that, and the other. But if they don't want that, it's their choice. Yeah, yeah. That's super interesting. Cause that market is gonna change. So how does that look? So right now we're in this like gray zone where those i buyers are three percent five percent of the market i think phoenix got up to a, a very high percentage but what about in 20 years where yeah. folks like me and you we grew up with those around and is, if they survive and that's still to be determined but if company if that model survives in some capacity like how's that look to folks that are 15 now and then they're buying their first house at 32 mm -hmm. and they've always known zillow right yeah that is interesting that i'm a little i i didn't know like 
there was that type of consumer in, in terms because I, I would just think oh whatever it gets me more money go with that one if that was the case it mm-hmm. everyone knows you can sell you can use a realtor to sell a house mm-hmm. so it, if that was the case if it was always about the money investors would not exist mm-hmm. like wholesalers would not exist all whole, all investors do is provide liquidity mm-hmm. providing a quick solution they can move on yeah now I'm not saying all investors are, they're definitely not looking out for the client's interest or, or the seller's interest. They're looking out for their own. You can do that ethically or unethically. That's a different conversation. Yeah. Because I'm an agent, I'm going to do what I have to do and properly disclose, give them their options, let them choose. But I mean, we flipped 200 houses. So we found a lot of people that they're perfectly okay. Handing over the keys, you can give them cash. They walk away, they're done. They don't have to worry about it. Worry about it, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's a lot of work to flip the house, and yeah, it, it's it's well, it's a lot of work, yeah. or yeah. they just don't want to deal with the hassles of the traditional process. Mm. That's why Open Door exists because there was this gap, mm. and um, so in, in the Zillow's and Open Doors, like investors have to worry about them too. Mm. I know agents are worried about them, but folks that are out there trying trying to uh, buy these nice homes, they want nice homes that are. They don't have, they basically just need cosmetic upgrades. So I can't pay what they pay. So that's actually going to put a squeeze on investors too. So that's why investors need to go in. That's why I think the investor agent has added value Hmm. because I'm not a one trick pony. Like I can actually go in and give you a whole variety of solutions and more tailored, more customized service depending on what you need. Whereas open door, they're going to do one thing. Right. Most agents, they'll do one thing. I've got a, a bit more education resources, you know, I can yeah. do a variety of things. Yeah. But yeah, the agent uh, and the, the investor that is also the agent, they're the ones that, in my opinion, have the, the, the most leverage and the most tools to offer someone and the best opportunity to get deals now and as this market, you know, evolves over time. Yeah, that's so good. We're just wrapping it up a little, what's a uh, like to get some more information and resources? What would you recommend? And then I know you also have a course coming out or, or yeah, tell us more about that. Yeah, so there's a lot of real estate investor courses out there and some good, some bad. I've taken plenty of them and ultimately I'm an agent, I'm an investor. So we came up with invested agents. Now, we know a lot of agents out there, they're out there hustling, working really hard for their clients. And it's not an easy job. Like it, it can be fun. It can be pretty darn stressful too. Yeah. So the, the thing that's disappointing is like most Americans, you can do that for 20 years and you don't have any equity in your business. Like unless you bought a franchise, you just don't. So unless you learn how to invest, build equity, build passive income, then you basically just had a job. You don't have any retirement. So we created Invested Agents, a platform to teach agents how to invest. And the whole idea is educate and maybe we'll do deals together. Maybe we can partner, maybe we can uh, work on financing, you can JV and but uh, trade referrals or whatever, but make it a very, collaborative type of platform and community where other agents and and I don't restrict it to just agents. That's just our target market, um, teaching agents because I'm agents. I like agents, (laughs) but just go out there, give value. Most of the stuff we do is free. We do have a paid course. I say paid, it's 67 bucks. Like it's $67 for something that we used to, not we, but my business partner used to charge 10 grand for. It's just, I just went to him. I was like, Hey, look, like this stuff that you have, what if we can find a way to give it to more people at a much or like ridiculously low price? And there's also a win-win for both of us. What would that look like? So that's how we came up with it. And so we have that core, that's coming up, but in any case, so yeah, most of the stuff we do is free with invest agents. Super cool, super cool. I love that. No, yeah. and, I, and I, I truly believe that you have to charge something because otherwise people won't read it or they won't go through it. I, I've given a free well, That's course. what I've been doing for years. Like <laughs> my wife and I, we've been running a RIA event in the Houston area for years. And um, what, <laughs> the joke is you have plate lickers, people who come for free food, but they'll never do anything. Yeah. Um, so you get a lot of those, but once you start charging, they leave, mm-hmm. then you get the serious folks. Mm-hmm. I paid five grand for stuff that wasn't worth five grand, but I find the nugget that either will make me or save me five grand. So yes. in that case, it's a win, even though it may not have been the best thing. I'm not charging five grand for anything. 
yet. Maybe I'll come up with something. I, I don't know. But <laughs> in any case, it's lead with value. Yeah. And it's the relationships that ultimately that's what's going to pay you long term. That's the long tail. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. We'll throw your information. What's the best way for people to contact you? Uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. I'm very active there. I love LinkedIn, but I do get bombarded with DMs. Uh, fa Facebook's a, sometimes a little easier, but either of those platforms, Instagram also, which, and then you know, we've got a YouTube channel and uh, me, you can shoot me an email, but I get bombarded with so many emails. So that's why I say LinkedIn or Facebook. Cool. Cool. LinkedIn and Facebook, we'll throw those up top. Cool, Chris. This is so cool talking about investing. Yeah, thank you so much for for chatting and give us giving us just some value and some info. Absolutely, it's been fun and it's been a true pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Till next time. All right, see you. See ya.